Okay, um, while we wait a few more minutes, um, my name is Sydney Gillette. I work at Spell and I will be the moderator today. Um, big thank you to Betaworks for hosting this panel and Kit for organizing. Um, and thank you to our panelists for joining, for taking the time to do this and for your thoughtfulness. And of course the attendees, we're really happy to have you. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from Spell. So a bit of a background about us for those of you who aren't familiar, we're New York based, uh, we're a few years old. And um, Spell is an MLOps platform that streams machine learning and deep learning experimentation and deployment. So what that means is we provide the DevOps for machine learning. Um, we're really an end-to-end -end platform and we provide the infrastructure and tools that allow anyone to prepare, train, deploy, and manage machine learning projects. So whether you're just getting started in machine learning, maybe you're taking a course online, whether you are experienced on a team or maybe even leading a team, um, check us out, uh, we're spell.run. And um, let's kind of dive in a little bit today and talk about what we're here for. Um, again, uh, we are here to explore what it takes to run a successful AI project, really from beginning to end and all the challenges that come along the way with that. Um, we have thought leaders from all different backgrounds here. Um, so we're really excited to hear everyone's thoughts um, on just managing AI projects. Uh, again, welcome to anyone who's joined us. In the meantime, feel free to tell us where you're dialing in from in the chat on the side. Um, looks like we have about two more minutes before we'll kick off. So I'd love to spend this time for the panelists to give an introduction about themselves. So Guy, lead us, um, and then Victor and Sircon, uh, go ahead and follow and give us a bit of a background about yourselves. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Guy Dasa. Uh, I'm from Verizon Media, previously uh, uh, Yahoo and AOL, acquired by Verizon, and I uh, run uh, Verizon Media's uh, Visual Intelligence uh, Group, which is uh, specializing in artificial intelligence for image and video. Victor. Hello, everyone. I'm Victor. And I'm the technical director for Doberman in New York. We're a design and technology studio uh, originally from Stockholm and started in New York um, as well. Uh, we help companies and startups to apply design and technology to solve problems. Um, and a lot of those AI using AI. Um, so uh, I'll Happy to share anything that we've learned from that. Glad to be here. Great. And uh, I'm Sircon Piantino. Um, I'm founder and CEO of Spell. Uh, and prior to uh, building Spell, I uh, ran AI research at Facebook and uh, was site director for Facebook in New York. And uh, we built Spell to take a lot of the cool technology that uh, we were developing and doing research on in AI and make it more accessible and uh, easier to use and deploy into real world projects uh, with Spell. So uh, hopefully happy to share some insights about what it takes to make those projects successful. Great, thank you everyone. And just to let the attendees know, we are going to be leaving 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer your questions. So please, Few questions into the Q&A as they come up. Don't be shy and we will get to those at the end. Um, okay, so we're at 3.05, let's dive in. Um, I'd love to kick off the conversation about learning about the interesting machine learning projects that you're working on or have worked on in the past. Um, Guy, why don't you lead the way here? Sure. Um... So if I talk about the more, more recent years, I mean, prior to Verizon Media, I was at Facebook um, and I, I worked a lot on personalization of the newsfeed. Uh, actually, Circon was one of the uh, first uh, developers or uh, uh, people who, who, who ran that. Um, and, um, and there it was more about personalization, about, about matching content to people. But in the last four and a half years, I've been focusing more on video and images uh, and especially around uh, cognition of uh, video content. Um, so not the first degree machine learning of detecting and segmenting objects in image and video, but more around what do we do with that? How we understand the semantics of videos? 
uh, how do we uh, create uh, useful annotations that can help us monetize the content we have and create better engagement. Um, so that, that's been a core areas of uh, focus of mine. Um, along with that, there's um, a lot of work that we do around um, face recognition and face memorization, which is an interesting problem space for us and relevant to our business. The business meaning the greater Verizon, not, not Verizon Media, which is more of a media company. Um, accessibility. Uh, so there's a variety of problems around consuming content for uh, people with disabilities, where AI uh, plays a great role. Um, AR experiences, uh, especially for sports and realistic experiences that combine digital uh, information into um, real world environment uh, expressed through video. Um, and also rethinking shopping uh, experiences. So how would people consume or discover products and experience uh, shoppable products in a digital environment? And this is even more true now in the COVID era where we can't go into brick and mortar stores. So there's a lot of new experiences that we need to think about. So all these involve uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of AI and uh, a lot of computer vision um, and modeling. And that's the kind of problems that I'm looking at. Um, Victor, let's uh, hear about what you've been working on at Doberman. Yeah, uh, I think the most recent and, and uh, interesting project is Ada by Pearson. So Pearson is a global education company, um, and they we've helped them launch a the, their first direct to consumer product, um, which is an AI powered math tutor for calculus. Um, so for higher ed, higher ed. Um, which has about, I guess, five or six sort of discrete ML components to it, um, including stuff that's been done a lot, like OCR, um, and things that are more, um, um, a little bit more uh, interesting or newer as like reinforcement learning for building out learning profiles and, and sort of understanding uh, how individuals best learn and, and consume um, learning content. Um, uh, which is has been a really interesting and and, and challenging project. Uh, a lot of the a lot of problem solving around operationalizing these technologies and optimizing them and and sort of figuring out how to best deliver them. Um, and then we also have done we do quite a lot of internal sort of experimentation and and prototyping and development. And the most recent one is uh, something around the Bechdel test, which is this. Um, idea around uh, female representation in, in film. Um, and I mean, the original uh, rule set was something like two women talking to each other about something else than a man uh, in a film for it to be sort of a classic, uh, which was uh, kind of like a barometer to see if it's what the, what kind of representation women had, had in film. Um, so we collaborated with uh, some partners and sort of experimented with a model to try and see if we could classify dialogue based on just the first couple of um, lines to see if it's uh, female to, to women or two men that are talking to each other, um, which is kind of another way to try and, and look at how, um, how women are represented in film. Um, and these, these are sort of experiments that we do that are not necessarily to be scientifically accurate, but more to uh, start conversations and, and, and sort of showcase how, how AI can be used to sort of be part of of changing the conversation or driving uh, solutions in these type of areas as well. Great, and I'll, I'll jump in with uh, some of the things. Uh, at Facebook, we, um, we started with a lot of projects that were uh, particularly around facial recognition and image understanding. So one of the first things we built was a, uh, a captioning system for all of the content that's coming in, uh, all the photos that are coming into Facebook. And that was really cool. Um, a lot of people, a lot of the blind use Facebook and prior to that work, couldn't really tell what was going on in, in photos in their newsfeed. And through captioning um, images and also understanding who's in the image, we're able to give them good summaries of images so they can use a screen reader, which is one of the first sort of things we did in research that then uh, we were really proud of seeing the impact um, in the product itself. Um, we also worked on some, some larger scale things. One was uh, using an embedding model to 
build a sort of map of all of the content coming into and out of Facebook, uh, embedding models being really, really powerful techniques for figuring out of a whole bunch of different content, what things are similar. Um, I'm not doing a great job of describing them, but very cool stuff. And that's all open sourced if you want to try it out uh, within PyTorch now. Uh, PyTorch Big Graph is some of the work we did there. Now at Spell, we focus a lot on um, basically this idea of how can the tools get out of the way. So even if you're running, uh, you know, a, an experiment that takes hundreds of gigabytes of, of data um, and needs to be run on a, you know, $40,000 machine with eight GPUs and um, all that needs to be coordinated across multiple clouds, et cetera. Um, how can we handle all of that so that people can have a faster experience with AI and just get more done? And so we work a lot on the infrastructure, which I'm really proud of, doing a lot of the complexity, uh, handling a lot of that so that the process of developing with AI can be simple. And um, I can talk a little bit about what our customers use the platform for. Um, and uh, particularly now, very relevant, uh, we have a lot of customers in the in the healthcare space. So they're doing things like running machine learning models on full human genomes to sort of identify uh, what base pairs, what sort of things in the genome correspond to, how they interact with each other and correspond to uh, disease. Um, things, you know, large scale informatics um, and a little bit of uh, uh, diagnosis. So automatically using AI to look at a at an x-ray, for instance, and, and figure out where the hairline fracture is, that type of thing. So um, that and a lot of, uh, a lot of other cool stuff um, that hopefully we'll get into later. Yeah, fascinating. So we really have a range here, which is great, um, kind of leading into this next question. Um, I'd love to hear from everyone about kind of the first steps you take when designing AI models, AI projects, Victor, you're in an interesting scenario because you're working with clients. So do you have any insights or challenges there as well as getting business buy-in or what that looks like for you as far as just the first steps of, of taking on a project like the ones you mentioned? Sure. Um, I think there's uh, clients that, are, that come that have less exposure internally or less internal capabilities around machine learning and AI often have often quite a lot of anxieties around it and sort of uncertainties and sometimes maybe a little bit of a uh, fear of, of missing out. Um, and I, they can sometimes get lost in this kind of decision para paralysis of where to start uh, and aim too far ahead and look at some something that's too big to really be actionable. Um, and we try and advise and work with them to find a, a very tangible first step they can take to prove how it can be valuable to their organization and business and how, help them implement that um, versus trying to sort of take on the, the biggest, hairiest problem to begin with, uh, but actually something that they, they can sort of showcase and, and use to generate more buy-in. Um, but I, I, and a lot of that also resolves around like looking at the actual uh, questions that they have in front of them, not just sort of the, their data, because if you start at the data, it's also sometimes siloed, hard to use, unknown how, how, what the, really the quality is. Um, so uh, sometimes we start more with sort of questions that they have and then try and work from that down to the solution. Um, and sometimes AI is not also the answer, uh, you know, when you start from that, that perspective, um, which is also good to know, so they're not kind of building something that then ends up not being um, valuable in their case for showcasing AI or, or, or machine learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and Sirkan, you have a variety of backgrounds, infrastructure as you just managed, experience at Facebook. Um, what are some of those first steps that you look at when you were designing those projects? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, you need a successful project always needs both the technical piece of somebody who understands how to implement the AI and what, what's possible with it, but it always takes the sort of subject matter experience um, you know, it always takes somebody that understands the problem that they're trying to solve deeply um, and maybe doesn't know about how the AI under the hood works. So sometimes what, you know, one strategy that I've used is try to articulate what is and what isn't possible with the technology. Um, that tends to be pretty hard, especially in, for instance, when I'm trying to talk about 
NLP and how far that's come. The difference between things that NLP can do really well and things that it can't is pretty subtle. And I think I find that hard. So a lot of times I ask people, you know, if you had an army of humans in a room and, you know, what's in a repeatable process, like what's something that you could ask an army of humans to do, maybe we can turn that into an automated system that we can have machines do. So that's kind of the first process is like technical sort of trying to turn something that's like a, a, a vision uh, from somebody who understands their space really well into like a more concrete process and like a more sort of function where there's inputs and if we could take those inputs and figure out these outputs, then we could turn that into a really amazing experience. Um, and then I think the second thing is even with something that's very precisely uh, specified like that, it's not really clear the AI is ever going to work on it. There's been a lot of results where you see all these amazing demos and on toy data sets, you see something uh, that works really well, but as soon as it transfers domains just a little bit, um, you can have all types of problems. So the, the next step is really just like getting that absolute baseline of performance, taking something off the shelf, taking a small amount of data, trying it out and seeing if, you know, this is really going to pan out because that's not always obvious. Um, and then uh, hopefully those thing, two things line up and you get into the sort of like meat of actually building the thing. Yeah, I may, I may jump in uh, if that's okay to also add, I agree with what Serkan and uh, Victor said. I would also look at the overall framework of what are you trying to solve, which I know it's a cliche question, but it's, it, it often changes dramatically what you're trying to build. Um, and um, um, I would be very critical about this question. And especially if a customer comes to you and asks you, can you build X, Y, or Z? And, uh, and sometimes they don't really phrase the question of what they're looking for well enough. And it's, it's worthwhile to drill in and, and have a better understanding of what are the metrics they're trying to optimize for? What is really the problem? that they are looking into and are they looking at the right problem? Maybe they need some discussion to, to clarify uh, with, within themselves and, and, and with you. Um, the other thing um, uh, also is, and I think Sorkan mentioned that too, is, is there's a lot of open sourced um, uh, models out there and frameworks. Um, so you don't need to reinvent the wheel for every problem you're trying to solve. There's so much out there and it's supported and it's maintained and Running, running a model in a production environment at scale is expensive and, um, and it's often something that you should think about in advance. How are you gonna run it? Is it gonna run on mobile devices? Is it gonna run on a server? How often will you need to update the model? So all these questions need to be um, uh, thought, thought through in advance because once you're providing the, the solution, you need to support it and you need to make sure you can actually do that. Great. Um, you all kind of hinted at this. Let's talk about challenges. There's many more I'm sure that you've all experienced. We'd love to hear maybe some stories even that we can learn from, but let's dive into typical pitfalls or challenges that you've come across in projects that you've led, maybe even things that came up that you weren't expecting. I think that um, um, a guy mentioned there in terms of uh, hosting a production and sort of running these as production services. Um, and one of the exciting parts of, of being in, in this field, we're interested in this field right now, is that it moves very quickly. Um, we had a, a situation where using uh, Google's AI platform from one week to the other, we kind of, our performance increased by 10x because they released a new machine um, that made it accessible for, uh, for, for prediction, which is kind of, both a blessing and sometimes a curse. Uh, like you don't really know what's coming down the line, so it can be kind of difficult to to design for that. Um, so that was that was extremely helpful for us and allowed us to make make a make a leap that we kind of were trying to a problem we were trying to solve in, a, in another way, and all of a sudden it was kind of given to us. Um, but it then also comes with additional practical challenges of scaling and how to manage peaks and, and, and traffic and stuff like this. Um, I think that is a uh, Part, like an ongoing challenge for, for to be solved for uh, tooling around that. I've seen two kind of things over and over. One is this happened a lot with both um, 
both at Facebook and with customers we work with at Spell, particularly when they're building dialogue agents, where I think like sometimes people start with an assumption that they need the most sophisticated approach out there. And so you see a lot of like uh, neural networks based techniques, just like really state of the art things to build, for instance, like a customer service chatbot or, you know, a dialogue agent for some other, some other application. And um, the longer and longer the project goes, the quicker, the farther and farther those things get walked back to simpler and simpler methods, more human intervention, more curation, more just like rules, engines, that type of thing. So I think lesson one is assuming you need the most sophisticated technique that exists is, is often, um, often costs you a lot of time and energy. And, um, and I've seen that happen a bunch of times. Um, the second thing that I've seen is failure to transfer. So uh, my co-founder Trey worked at a company called Clarify, which built this really, you know, productized a lot of the work uh, in computer vision um, that, you know, can really spot anything in objects, can really understand images, something we couldn't do 10 years ago. Um, but one of, the, one of the arcs you see with that company is that they have to, you know, they build a general purpose system for spotting anything in images, but the performance isn't good enough and uh, to work on a relative specific problem, um, let's say, you know, nudity detection or, or something like that. And so you end up building a specific model for that problem. And then the next application that comes along, you end up making a specific model for that problem. And what you find is that like when you thought you were gonna build a general purpose system, you actually end up retraining it, redeploying it, re-engineering it for every new application. So um, I think the more specific, I think that's the other lesson is that assuming a general purpose, particularly if you're pulling something open source out of research uh, thing will work even if on a slight change to the problem um, that is the one that you're trying to solve, sometimes it doesn't work out that well. Yeah, I would add, um, think incremental. We tend to think about solving the whole problem in advance. Um, I know I've done that, people I work with have done that uh, many times in the past. Um, and it's good to to break the problem to smaller pieces and then try to solve incrementally and learn and shape the, the solution as you go. Um, and also um, um, we make some assumptions on, again, on the business. And, um, you know, there's, I, I, I used to think that the technology is the harder part or the hardest part, but uh, learning that there's a lot of other um, uh, complexities that involve how this technology is actually going to be used. For example, do you have content rights? Uh, do you have, um, um, do you have, uh, if it's an advertising product, is there actually an appetite from advertisers? So going back to the, 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 the business questions. Um, so this is again, from my experience, something that um, I, I learned and highly recommend thinking about as you design your solutions. If you're, if you're in a situation where you're, you're planning a project that is an AI or machine learning driven, try to have some kind of milestones that you can communicate and you can uh, make, make a course correction so you don't end up working for many months on something and then it's irrelevant. Not to mention that there may be some open source solution that would be better than yours by that time that you, you reach your, you know, your uh, final milestone. So keep reevaluating all the time. Yeah, I, I really, I want to, I really agree with that. The, a lot of, you know, a lot of the work that we're using was frontline research just a couple of years ago. And so I think a lot of uh, AI being used for real problems is also bringing a little bit of the research mindset into, uh, into places, you know, into industry. And the research mindset is very incremental. You know, the, the analogy people use is like feeling around in a dark room. And I think, uh, I think that's really the experience, even if you're using known technique in a very like well-structured environment, you're still experimenting, you're still figuring things out as you go. And, um, and that's, that's a change, especially for people who have a software engineering background. Uh, you know, you're used to being able to see all the way to the finish, at least in some, in some sense when you start a project, but that's not really possible with ML. So you have to take it step by step. 
Yeah, that is something we've seen quite tangibly when collaborating with R&D um, departments on the client side. So large, larger companies with sort of uh, several maybe different R&D departments that do data science or, or, or different types of development. And um, I have found quite a lot of overlap in terms of the mindset, in terms of, uh, I would say, ambition in terms of how to want to work and how to sort of uh, work iteratively and, and database and so um, and, and shape the solution. Um, at the same time, there's also these kind of almost comical differences where um, someone who's a, a experienced full stack front end developer would not really be that challenged by like sw switching from one JavaScript framework to the other or so forth. And, and, and an R&D engineer will take a step back and go, oh, hey, I'm just going used to this and I need to now evaluate this. And it's a bit more of a sort of um, academic process in a way for good reason, because that's what you need to do when you're picking up like a research paper or, or, a, or a theoretical solution and you need to try and apply that to your problem. So it is a more structured approach. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, that can be very complementary. You can, you can find really good collaborations there where there's a clear handover, um, both from a product design and, and, and system design perspective um, and architecturally. So you can sort of set up your workflow to really enable that collaboration. Yeah, I want to add one more last point, uh, which is um, think about how you're going to support your models, your work, um, how you package it. Because um, um, if, you, if you deliver a solution to a, a third party or an internal customer, it doesn't matter, you need to own it and support it. And maybe the data is such that you need to retrain the model every now and then. And, um, and so, Think a lot about how you package your work, whether you use Docker images or you use, you know, an API behind uh, as the front facing um, uh, interface to your customer, uh, but strive to have really great documentation and, and proper packaging. So that will be easier for you to support what you deliver, especially if you have a lot of people, different customers who consume it. Uh, you want to make it as simple as possible because otherwise it's going to be a nightmare for you to update everyone that they need to download the new Docker image with a new model uh, and so on. Great. We sort of hinted at this kind of idea of communicating and educating. Um, so when it comes to your approach of sharing outcomes where you're communicating and educating people maybe about the results of those experiments, even the challenges, um, what does that look like for you? Um, what are some of the challenges about communicating results? Um, take that where you want to, but I would love to kind of dive into what that looks like for everyone here. Um, Guy, you're working um, with a big team. I would love for you to kick this one off. Yeah, especially when you work with uh, a lot of teams that are not, they don't really understand what happens behind the scenes. For them, it's like magic. Um, it's hard for them to really understand. It, as much as it's hard for them to define the problem that they want to solve in terms of, okay, what kind of technology we need, it's also hard for them to evaluate if what you gave them is what they are actually looking for and how do they know it's successful other than the anecdotal usage. Um, so I, I find that visualizations help a lot. Uh, there are key metrics like precision and recall or coverage or, uh, and again, it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. And so it's, it's really important to um, articulate the the quality and the progress you're making on, on these kind of fundamental metrics that can can resonate with with your customer and whoever is uh, is using your technology uh, visualizations could be you know uh, showing a lot of examples whether it's let's say you're 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 classifying something or you're detecting something so you know show 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 the extreme cases show the the hard cases so they can really get convinced that oh this is working as I expect. Uh, the other thing is uh, we use a lot of uh, human uh, judges or uh, labelers who uh, we do a lot of case studies where we um, we test our solution uh, on on a large or we produce a, a large number of um, um, whether it's classifications or detection or whatever it is and we have human editors who actually judge and score uh, so you can produce a score that then you can show it to whoever is going to consume the work. And it really resonates because it was made by humans and the humans, you know, provided the, their, their stamp that it's what they would expect. And, uh, and that, that, that goes a long way to, to convince uh, and to also for us to, do our, to, to keep ourselves honest that we're doing the right thing. 
I would say for, for us that question is often based around uh, releasing something. Um, a, a lot of our internal experimentation that we do, I think as the, maybe as a company rooted in design, we're, we sort of naturally want to tell a story around it and, and build something out of it and, and get it out there. Um, and whatever shape that is. So uh, I think releasing source code and, and sort of writing articles is kind of like a baseline in, the, in that regard and something that I think is kind of expected, um, but also releasing the actual product uh, and an app on the app store or um, an API or whatever it is that, that you've created so people can try it and feel it and experience it in some way. Um, it's, it's a really powerful way of, of doing that. And um, obviously for, for us, it's, it's, it's also a sales tool or, I was, or like a, a tool to generate interest and show capabilities. Um, but it, it's not, um, doesn't take away from the fun of also releasing stuff. That is also like a, why we're all here, I think. Yeah, I, th I mean, everybody already covered it, but definitely from my experience at Facebook, we had one little iOS app that was our AI demos app. And that was by far, even though it didn't contribute to any of the projects we were working on, just in terms of attention and like enthusiasm for the work we were doing, that was definitely the best resources we ever spent. So, uh, you know, charts are nice, stories are, are good, demos tell the story uh, a million times better. Great. Um, and just a reminder for the attendees in the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A. We will get those to, at, get to those um, at the end. We'll leave around 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but please throw them in there as they come up and um, we'll, we'll get to those later. Um, okay, so let's zoom out a little bit. Um, and I'd like to discuss, have you all discuss workflow trends that you're seeing in the space. You've seen the space evolve, and now we're in 2020, almost midway through the year. Um, what's exciting you? What are you seeing? What's working? What's not? Let's dive into those. Sircon. Yeah, I mean, um, so much has changed. I think one of our predictions, um, one of our predictions was that there was going to be this sort of merging of software engineering where people are writing code and machine learning. Um, it used to, you know, a lot of the frontline machine learning work has moved from R or MATLAB or like platforms like that that are specific to now Python code. And so it's sitting alongside, you know, sort of real traditional software engineering. Um, the interfaces that people use, uh, like so much more is in Python scripts or in, um, in, uh, in Jupyter Notebooks, those are like far and away the most common tools that we see people using. And just in general, like the world of machine learning, which was academic and often like very specialized skill set and software engineering, which was often very different, they're pretty merged now. The person that we see doing the ML projects uh, is often either, is often just a, a software engineer that has learned on their own, has taken some coursework online. So um, I think that's been really fascinating. The other things around the workflow, um, we also, uh, the data sizes, the compute capacity, just everything scale is way, way more important. And that's driving a lot of how workflows are changing. Um, as well, you know, there's a lot of attention. Nvidia used to be a gaming company, and now uh, you s probably hear more buzz around their products, around launches in the machine learning, AI research, deep learning community uh, than elsewhere. So um, yeah, it's just like we are compute bound again, which is an interesting, an interesting place to be. And then, um, you know, just building building Spell, we uh, we thought we guessed a little bit at what people were going to want to be doing when, when they started to get more serious about AI and ML. And it's still very early, even though AI research has been going on for a while. And AI is something we talk about, you see movies about it, you read about in Wired Magazine, et cetera. It's still very early in terms of it actually getting used in a lot of industries and, and across most of the, the corporate world. And, um, but it's happening quickly and there wasn't even really a name for the software that makes this easier. And now there's a whole field called ML ops, which is, you know, kind of the category we're in. There are, you know, people, uh, new companies, 
the ecosystem is growing really, really quickly. So, um, so just a huge explosion, a lot more coding than, uh, and a lot more software engineering expertise and a lot bigger, more expensive computers. Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, we see our clients invest time and effort and manpower and, and people power into building these tool chains themselves um, and duplicating efforts between companies and also diverting effort maybe away from core expertise in in, in machine learning or whatever. Um, so uh, we see quite a, a lot of people needing these old, sort of already prepared, worked through, tested, proven solutions that kind of tie together from data to production um, and sort of provide traceability and, and collaboration and handoff between um, sort of research and production. That, that is that is definitely, and I think you're starting to see um, some, I guess MLOps as, as, as a term is, is, is a great sort of umbrella and you're starting to see these kind of um, uh, distinctions underneath that in terms of uh, the, the pipeline that sort of people, these products go through. Um, which is which is great. I, I wish a lot of our clients, R&D teams, spent less time on tooling and more time on machine learning. I would add to that um, first is that there's lots of great conferences and workshops. There's a lot of good stuff that is available publicly, and it uh, becomes really quickly building blocks in the process, uh, in the workflow, uh, as as it's easy to incorporate and. Um, the other thing is synthetic data, which is also, you know, data is always a big problem of, uh, even though there's plenty of data sets out there publicly available with license to use, uh, there's still a lot of areas, you know, that the public data is not going to cover all the possible, uh, types of data. And so there's, there's new techniques around that, that make the workflow, uh, simpler and, uh, a lot faster. Uh, and finally there's. I find that there's there's a lot of tools in the cloud, the public clouds. Uh, we use AWS a lot. Um, so whether you use SageMaker or uh, or Kaggle, you know, in some cases. But there's there's there are a lot of other tools that make make the process a little easier. Jupyter notebooks that were mentioned. Uh, so yeah. I was so one area that I'm. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert at, but that I find really interesting and I've seen a little bit lately is sort of automation of bias control and, and interpretability and like having not, not only from the perspective of sort of managing the bias of, of, of models, but also from a sort of regulatory and, and oversight perspective, um, which I think is really interesting. Great. Um... And next, um, you know, we kind of hinted at this a little bit, but what are some interesting machine learning techniques that you've come across? Um, you know, especially, you know, within the last six months or the few months um, that you're looking at, that you're excited about, what, what's, what's out there and what have you been thinking about? I think I'm really interested in, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Guy, you first, please. Oh, it's okay. Um, so, I, you know, for me as a uh, working on 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 video, um, I find it really interesting to take um, to take audio and visual uh, input as well as textual input, and bring them all to a common common level representation. So we've been playing a lot with transformers. Um, uh, it's been really interesting. For example, if you want to generate a caption for an image uh, automatically, so one thing is to detect the objects in the image. The second thing is to actually create a sentence that describes the image in a, in a very reliable manner. So that that's something that uh, has been really interesting to to do, and uh, does, it's it's been an area of a lot de a lot of development uh, over the last couple of years and. Um, uh, uh, I've seen really good results and really, really interesting outbreak uh, um, uh, breakthroughs from it. Um, and then uh, deep fakes are really fascinating, especially around uh, detecting them. Uh, that's that's always been a, 
I mean, not always, but it's, it's still relatively new. And with the coming elections, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that's uh, going to pan out, especially for Facebook. I would think that's going to be a major challenge to detect them. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Zachary. I was going to say, um, thanks, Gary. I was going to say, sometimes you have the type of research where a, you can do a new thing and state of the art improves. And that's always really exciting. But um, I also get really excited about the things where uh, previous technique is now way less, uh, you know, way easier to use or more resilient or can be run in real time and is much more efficient. So um, I really like, there's a, there's a computer vision out there called YOLO. I think it's now state of the art is YOLO v4. And it does object detection. It'll draw bounding boxes around all the elements in a scene and, and label them. But what's cool about it is that on relatively easy to find hardware, it'll run at 30 frames a second. So you can, you know, actually see in real time video, uh, you know, this machine that understands all the different objects that are in there and, uh, and how they're moving. That's really exciting. Um, I like the creative aspect of a lot of things. Um, so GANs in particular are this very general, often really difficult to implement and train technique where you can look at a couple examples of something and then imagine sort of other examples of the same thing. So you might show it 10 images of birds and then it might imagine all types of birds that you've never seen before, big ones, you know, ones with yellow, yellow feathers, that type of thing. Um, and there are all types of different flavors of this where you can instruct them what to, what to imagine, et cetera. We're actually, uh, we built one that we trained on, um, we trained on both images of, of uh, Bob Ross paintings, but also on segmentation masks. So uh, we'll be releasing something pretty soon where you can kind of outline where you want the sky to be and draw a little mountain. And then the network will automatically color it in and make it a full Bob Ross painting. So look for that, that'll be really fun to play with. Um, so a lot more creativity in how we're applying these things. And then I, I also just, sometimes the, the innovation just comes from doing the same thing you were doing, except 10,000 times more. And so every time there's a new, a new chip that comes out, every time we can touch a different, you know, we have this intuition, but we know these numbers that like the biggest, um, the biggest neural networks that are kind of models of the brain that we can train now are on the order of a couple billion of billion neurons. And even those take a really long time to, to run any kind of training on. We know the human brain is somewhere around 100 trillion. So scale is a part of this question of, of what type of intelligent stuff we can do. And uh, I, you know, I hope the chip designers are working as hard as the, uh, the ML practitioners. Yeah, I was gonna definitely talk about Gantt because I think that's really fascinating and fun to play with. Um, I think the, the only thing I'd add uh, that I, we look at or think about is kind of running um, bring an edge AI or sort of models closer to the user, um, partly for performance and uh, partly for um, privacy um, aspects. Um, we've been playing with this platform, uh, prototyping platform that Google has called Coral, which is basically a Raspberry Pi with a TPU on it. And you can get some really, um, really high frame rates and, and sort of uh, prediction rates uh, going locally, uh, which is really fun. And that kind of opens up some creativity as well. Great. Um, okay, a bit more of a serious question and one that's valid. And I think we hear this question come up a lot, but it's always interesting to hear everyone's perspective on this. Let's talk about keeping data secure and avoiding bias. How do you approach that? Um, Sirkon, can you start on this one? Yeah. Yeah, we, um, and there, I definitely have some stories around this. I mean, we, uh, one of the groups that, that I ran was the uh, facial recognition group at Facebook, which was really a lot of really powerful technology, but we immediately started seeing differences in performance based on, uh, you know, race and gender. Uh, there's just a lot, when you start putting humans into machine learning systems, it's one of the first things you need to check for is, is uh, are we introducing bias? Um, and we came up with not just, I think, we came up with not just uh, solutions to these problems, but oftentimes by addressing the bias in the data and by addressing the bias in the model we were trying to predict, 
we actually ended up with uh, better results. One of my favorite pieces of writing of all time is, is called How to Build a Racist AI Without Even Trying. Uh, if you Google that, you'll, you'll find it. And it basically is a really, really short tutorial on starting with Wikipedia posts and then building a sentiment classifier and then checking based on, um, you know, reviews on Netflix that sure enough, your sentiment classifier does a good job of spotting bad reviews and good reviews. And, um, and then starting to put, put in things like people's names and, uh, you know, gendered job occupations. It's like very sort of alarming how easily it is to introduce really dangerous biases into a machine learning system. But the better part of the story is that later, by debiasing some of the inputs, uh, by sort of addressing that earlier in the process, not only do you get something that's a little bit more sensible on what it determines to be positive and negative, but also you get better overall performance. And so, um, so anyway, yeah, bias is really an important thing. I think there's a whole field of research and you're starting to see some products that anybody can kind of use that do a lot for bias and model explainability, which are kind of different uh, pieces of the same coin, et cetera. Um, in terms of data privacy, um, you know, one thing we found is we've had to put a huge amount of work into being very flexible about where pieces of our infrastructure, where our tools actually operate on data. So we're constantly, we're in the business of making data and a GPU or a machine somewhere appear instantaneously somewhere so an experiment can run and you can get the results. And um, what we found working with customers is that we have to be really careful. We have to build into our system boundaries so that some, you know, most of our customers will not work with Spell if their data leaves their cloud environment or their physical uh, hardware or, um, or things like that. So, um, so, you know, our approach to privacy is go to where the data is and make the software work around where the data is and around the security and privacy realities of, uh, of the customer we're working for. We, I think you kind of have to assume that the data is going to be biased to begin with. Um, because the data is, I mean, it's generated by humans, it's generated by our systems and our structures, and it's kind of where the bias comes from. Um, we saw this in this Bechtel, Bechtel uh, data set we used the uh, Cornell had the data set on movie dialogues, um, and we filtered it down to just dialogues between men and dialogues between women. Uh, I think the split was. 20,000 between men and 3,000 between women. Mm -hmm. Like already there, you have sort of the bias sort of glaringly visible to you, um, which then forced us to, uh, to circuit points, sort of work with the data and, and make sure we had a better starting point for, for training. Um, so we didn't end up with that type of bias from the, from the get go. Um, yeah, when we were, we were looking at uh, bias in our face recognition systems, you know, we found some literature on, um, you know, different, uh, you know, the way images are encoded, you know, the sample images that, uh, that they use for encoding faces that they use to sort of tweak CCD sensors on your phone. A lot of, they're looking at, you know, most often white men and, uh, and white women for those things. We found literature about bias going back to the 50s when, you know, film cameras were a real thing. And, uh, you know, most of the portraiture, people do these subjective tests of the quality of film, and they look at portraits of, you know, uh, of white women. So the, uh, yeah, I think just definitely want to echo the fact that wherever you look, you're going to be encountering bias. And that's definitely something that you want to think about uh, playing some defense against when you're designing your ML systems. Yeah, on the privacy um, of the, uh, you know, the keeping data secure and, and private, there is also the, the whole issue with biometric data, which is increasingly more, um, more in the news. Uh, there are countries that use biometric data, many countries that use biometric data for tracking civilians and, um, and, and various use cases. And that's a very sensitive issue, especially in the US, um, and uh, there are actually a few states like Illinois where you cannot do 
face recognition without uh, approval of the people that you're recognizing in advance. Uh, so you have to be very, very careful with that. Um, also storing, uh, you know, one thing is to store images, but the other thing is even, even vectoral representation of faces to store that on a server, even that is not enough. Um, there's all sorts of uh, regulations and, and retention policies that uh, you need to adhere to to make sure that your data is secure. Uh, so that's something that um, that we see a lot. And also, um, there is, uh, the, especially around enterprises who are more and more using AI in their facilities, there is a interest in, in what, what is called the private multi-access edge computing, MEC, uh, or private MEC. Um, which is um, which is almost like a mini data uh, mini data center that um, is deployed at your facility. Think about a cell tower, for example, but not really a cell tower, but really a small data center maintained by uh, as an edge by uh, whether it's Amazon or another cloud company or, or a network company. So that gives you that gives the the enterprise uh, the the consumers of the 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 Mac. Um, more control over the data that, that they produce and protects the, the privacy of their, the people who use it or produce it. Great, thanks everyone. So we have a little less than 10 minutes left. We might go a couple minutes over, but we have some audience questions uh, that I'd like to get to. Um, the first one from Joe, will this recording be shared? Absolutely. Um, if you sign up for Spell's MLOps newsletter, um, we will be sharing a link to the recording. So if you just visit spell.run, um, you know, at the bottom of the page, there's a little sign up. And we'll put a link as well um, in the Q&A so you can access that. Okay, so let's dive in. Um, our first question is from Rebecca Evanho and Victor, I'm going to send this one your way first. Um, she says, hi, I'm a conversational AI designer. I'm curious how you folks view UX design. Is that part of your process? How do you view the relationship between development and design in the ML AI space? Uh, it's most certainly uh, part of it. Yes, uh, for this um um, project we did with Pearson, we did about 150 user testing sessions, um, testing um, out how to surface AI feedback and AI sort of interactions in a way that resonated well and, and sort of promote, provoked the type of, of response that we were looking for from a learning perspective. Um, we are a very interdisciplinary uh, oriented uh, group, um, designers and developers work together from the start, side by side. It's not like all the designers need to be ML experts, uh, but part of what uh, our developers are really good at is translating between sort of the, the technology side and the, um, the more user facing and, and more business side and bringing designers along on the journey to be able to understand and input along the way. Um, so uh, it, it's definitely key uh, to have, have as a part of it. It's obviously also the, the point that the, the guy made several times around, like starting with the question and going back to what you want to achieve um, and sort of finding, finding out what the problem, what the limitations are. It's something that designers are experts at. The design is a great, a great um, practice for. Um, so you kind of want a two-way interaction there in order to really build something that meets the need that you set out to do. Great. Thanks, Victor. Um, anything else to add to that or we can move on to the next one? All right. Um, the next question is from Mehdi Esmail and pardon me if I mispronounced your name, Mehdi. Um, his question is, a big aspect of AI projects is getting the data ready, e.g. data cleansing, constructing training data sets, labeling, and especially in cases of classification projects. What approaches are you using to streamline and automate these critical time-consuming steps? Um, Sirkan? Yeah, so uh, definitely managing data uh, is one of the, the biggest challenges. We find, um, so there are a lot of tools that are good at going from time series data uh, to sort of clean time series data. 
there's a lot of work that uh, we call, you know, would traditionally be called feature engineering. And that work's really important. Um, what's interesting is that in the deep learning world, a lot of it is too rigid for, for the types of uh, applications that, that you're trying to build. So what we found is just like, you know, we, we saw a lot of sort of what uh, some one of our customers called them clicky tools. So tools where there's a UI and sort of like specific type of interface. And we found a lot of those for model development um, in the previous generation that now with deep learning and Python frameworks and sort of in all the ways that things have changed, you really need sort of like full code control that now has become software. We're seeing the same things with the data pipelines. Um, there is a generation of tools that are, that are coming out now that are kind of like real rigid, solid developer oriented stuff for, uh, for data pipelines. It's still a little bit early. Um, and that's also stuff that we've built into Spell. So any, um, we have a whole workflows product for building and executing long stage workflows uh, that, uh, that generally do include, you know, processing data, creating data sets, building some reproducibility into it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, obviously one of the most time consuming things uh, in the in the workflow for ML and definitely evolving as much as everything else. Sometimes it's worth the, the effort to invest in looking for public data that is available. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's very often that you'll find for many tasks, the large data set is already ready to go. Yeah, and one thing, one of the most common problems is it's one thing to have the data, but it's also another thing from a reproducibility standpoint to be able to ask the question, what was the data as of the time I trained this model or as of X, Y, or Z? And a lot of tools don't really provide that out of the box. So you either end up um, taking all the data that you trained on and archiving it somewhere so you can access it later, or I've seen some larger organizations actually build this like, you know, give me the data as of, you know, without any updates, without anything that changed. Uh, but that becomes really important. Reproducibility is a huge, uh, a huge advantage. And if you have money, you can always use uh, other companies that do that, the labeling for you or the, you know, cleanup for you. There's plenty of companies out there. Yeah, we've seen clients put the, that type of work in to build those data, that data management pipeline in some way in data programs. Um, it's also been interesting to see client, uh, so the generation of synthetic data the guys mentioned before as a, as a way to get around um, the lack of data or the type of data that you have and kind of expanding. Um, I, I, it's been pretty successful, but I, I'm sure there are quite a lot of limitations, especially early on in, a, in, a, in the modeling model design. Uh, but I think as a as a way to, to optimize and sort of uh, expand the, the range of your data. I think that's a, a, an interesting tool to look at. Great, okay, um, we have one more question here. Guy, this one's for you. Um, this question comes from Kelly. Uh, they say, what advice do you have for product designers who do not have any technical experience or knowledge? Um, any advice or resources that you can recommend? It looks like they designed a, a product and they're refining for prototyping, um, kind of combining art and science, and they're looking for mechanical or opti optical engineer to, to kind of help them with that project. So any resources you can recommend around that? Um, yeah, there's, there's um, I'm trying to think what would be a really good example. Um, but. Um, I would look at, the, there's some large conferences like uh, CVPR and ECCV, if you look them up, there's plenty of workshops there and there's a, a lot of pointers to solutions, especially if it's, it's relatively new things. Um, if it's basic things, uh, then, then usually I would just Google it. Um, but, um, there, there is a lot of Jupyter notebooks out there that uh, if you search Git um, that have already kind of published like an end-to-end -end solution with the documentation. And all you need to do is just download the code and run it step-by-step. -step. It's, it's really, you don't need to know what you're doing. You just need to set up an environment. They will tell you how to do that. Um, and then you just, you just 
deployed locally for you know for a starter and, and then uh, and then run it in seed. So I would say uh, you can look at, at these major conferences: uh, C CVPR, ICCV, ECCV, and there's NURIPS, which is also a really good one. Um, you can look at uh, at Git for uh, for uh, some repos that have, and you can search Google for that. Just search what you're looking to do, and you likely find. Uh, uh, a link to that, and and then there from there, Jupiter is a really good way to, a uh, very user friendly tool to, uh, uh, to to run stuff and see the results without without having a, a command, uh, you know, without doing it from command line or, uh, you know, or having tons of expertise. You'll still need to know some programming, uh, but not a whole lot. Great. Okay, we are a little bit over time here, um, so we're going to close it out. I do have one fast question for all the panelists, but as a reminder, we will be sharing this recording. Um, at Spell, we will be hosting a number of these webinars over the next coming months, um, so go ahead and give us a follow or just sign up for that newsletter as well to see as those come up. Um, but we came here today to talk about AI experimentation, prototyping, and design. Um, so in 30 seconds from each of you, you know, what is the main message that you would like the audience to take away or a main piece of advice that you'd like to, like to say? Um, Guy, Victor, Sirkan, um, take it away. Um, sure, so um, don't be afraid of AI, try things, um, do your research, do, your, do the lookup for, um, for what's out there because unlike five, 10 years ago, a lot is open source, a lot is shared. So don't, don't approach AI as, oh, I need to start from scratch. I need to know everything. You don't need to know everything. You can just look it up. Uh, you, you can find what you're looking for. Probably 90% of what you're trying to solve is already solved by someone else and it's publicly available. So I highly recommend that, you know, start from there and then, uh, and then you know, incrementally uh, add whatever you want to do that is, uh, that is, um, is going to get you to where you want to, where you want to go. Yeah, I was going to use the exact same word, don't be afraid. Um, it feels like in, in the level of the tree of complexity, there are tools all the way from super high level and user friendly all the way down to the super advanced. Um, and you can, at this point, find a tool that can fit your style of learning. If it's visual, if it's more database, data based or logical based. Um, and also matching your sort of skill level if you're coming at it with some development experience or none. Um, it's all, all all available to you and you get stuck in. Yeah, and uh, I mean, mostly I'm gonna say the same thing. I think early on uh, research labs, um, you know, Facebook AI research, Google DeepMind, Google Brain, um, uh, OpenAI, I think we did a really bad job of turning AI into this very academic, very inaccessible, very sophisticated, complicated uh, thing. And that's how people perceive it. And sometimes uh, even like a scary thing, like, you know, we don't know what the scientists are doing behind closed doors. We definitely know what the scientists are doing behind closed doors. It's, I would say, you know, going from that world to, we used to host a study group every, every week at the spell offices and, um, we had, you know, one of our, our best students, somebody who was helping everybody else getting get through the curriculum and with their problems, had only learned, you know, he had spent the previous month learning Python and now was learning AI and was building, you know, his project was building a voice control system for his sister who was blind to operate uh, her Mac and do more things with uh, her home automation system. I think learning the Python necessary and the frameworks required to just do some basic projects in AI is easier than, you know, learning C++ or Java or building a mobile app. It's shockingly easy. And so that's a lot of why we started Spell because uh, we wanted people to play with AI and to find it to be this easy, awesome technology instead of this scary, sophisticated, out of reach thing. And, um, and that would be my advice is to um, write some Python, see if you enjoy it. Great advice from everyone. Okay, we have hit the end. Um, thank you, Victor, Guy, Sirkan, um, for your input today. 
um, and to all of our attendees for joining. Um, we'll be doing this again and we'd love to see you there. So have a great day, everyone, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.